Chris Wallace, the leaders of North and South Korea pledged to rid the Korean Peninsula of nuclear weapons. Now can President Trump seal the deal? It's going to be a very important meeting. The denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula of North Korea. The denuc. Denuc. We'll discuss what comes next for Kim Jong-un and President Trump. I look forward to our meeting. It should be quite something. With John Bolt in his first Sunday show appearance as White House National Security Advisor. Then the president's new lawyer meets with Robert Mueller as a Senate panel moves to protect the special counsel. We'll ask Democrat Chris Coons about his bipartisan bill and whether it will make it to the full Senate for a vote. Plus, trouble for the Trump cabinet. His nominee to lead the VA withdraws, while his EPA chief gets grilled over ethics. Facts are facts and fiction is fiction. And a lie doesn't become truth just because it appears on the front page of the newspaper. We'll ask our Sunday panel about the president's promise to drain the swamp. And our power player of the week, we meet a leader of the arms race for ideas in Washington. The guiding mission of this institution is to be that true north for the conservative movement. All right now on Fox News Sunday. And hello again from Fox News in Washington. This week's historic summit between the leaders of North and South Korea has set the stage for a face-to-face -face meeting between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. It will be the first time the leaders of the U.S. and North Korea have ever met and central to the agenda trying to get Kim to abandon his nuclear weapons program. Joining us now, John Bolton in his first Sunday show interview as the president's national security advisor, Ambassador. Welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Glad to be here. Let's start with the Trump, uh, the Trump Kim summit. Is it going to happen when and where? Well, I think it is going to happen. Uh, the dates and the places are still under discussion. Uh, I think the president is eager to do it as soon as possible, but uh, we still need to work out the precise parameters. Well, you say eager to do it as soon as possible. Is the U.S. side ready to sit down and talk? We will be when we do sit down. I think it's uh, something that the president has thought a good deal about already. Uh, and I think people around the world have already given him credit for establishing the preconditions for this to happen in the first place. Uh, President Moon of South Korea, for example, has been very clear that but for the pressure, the economic pressure, the political military pressure that President Trump has put on North Korea, we would not be where we are today. Given how apparently well the meeting between Kim and the South Korean president went on Friday, what could stop a Trump-Kim summit from happening? Well, we need to agree on a place, and, uh, and that remains uh, an issue. But uh, if, in fact, Kim has made a strategic decision to give up his entire nuclear weapons program, then I think deciding on the place and the date should be fairly easy. Okay, so let's talk about your position, the U.S. position going in, what the U.S. wants from Kim. Will President Trump insist that Kim give up, ship out all of his nuclear weapons, all of his nuclear fuel, all of his ballistic missiles before the U.S. makes any concessions. Yeah, I think that's what denuclearization means. And we have very much in mind the Libya model from 2003, 2004. Uh, there are obviously differences. The Libyan program was much smaller. Uh, but that was basically the agreement that we made. And uh, so we'll want to test North Korea in this first meeting for evidence that they have made that strategic decision. Uh, and we have, uh, we have history to give us uh, some assistance on it. In uh, 1992, the joint North-South denuclearization agreement uh, had North Korea pledging to give up any aspect of nuclear weapons and to give up uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing. Now, we've got other things to talk about as well, ballistic missiles, chemical and biological weapons, the American hostages, the Japanese abductees. But starting on the nuclear side with what North Korea agreed to more than a quarter of a century ago is a pretty good place to start. But just, just to pin this down, North Korea has to give up 
basically its whole program before the U.S. begins to relieve economic sanctions. Yeah, I think that the maximum pressure campaign that the Trump administration has put on North Korea has, uh, along with the uh, political military pressure, has brought us to this point. I mentioned President Moon before this just this past week, President Macron of France, Chancellor Merkel of Germany, uh, Prime Minister Abe of Japan, the week before that, this morning, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull of Australia, have all acknowledged we are at this point because of American pressure. Relieving that pressure isn't going to make negotiation easier. It could make it harder. What kind of time frame uh, for North Korea to give up its weapons? How quickly would they have to do it? And is there any possibility that the U.S. would accept North Korea as a nuclear power and allow them to keep some of their infrastructure. I don't see how that's possible. And again, the North Koreans have already agreed to this. They agreed to it in 1992 with South Korea, and they've pledged similar things since then. Now, it's also the case that they've lied about it and broken their commitments, which is one reason there's nobody in the Trump administration starry-eyed about what, uh, what may happen here. But by demonstrating they've made a strategic decision to give up nuclear weapons, it would be possible to move quickly, as, the, again, the Libya case uh, demonstrates. Well, when you say quickly, we're talking by the end of the year? Well, it's a, it's a matter, first, of finding out just how much there is to dismantle. I mean, it, it's, it's not possible to go to this meeting with a set of screwdrivers and think we're going to take it apart beginning the day after the meeting. Uh, and, and therefore, the full, complete, total disclosure of everything related to their nuclear weapons program with uh, full international verification, and I think uh, following Libya, uh, uh, verification by American and other inspectors is, uh, could be very important here. Now, the joint statement from the two Koreas on Friday called for, and I want to put it up on the screen, a nuclear-free Korean peninsula and some people have suggested that means, yep, the North Koreans are going to give up everything they've got, but in return, the U.S. would agree that we are not going to allow any nuclear-armed airplanes or nuclear-armed ships on the Korean Peninsula. Is that acceptable? Well, we certainly haven't uh, made that commitment. And again, uh, I'm looking at the uh, Panmunjom Declaration, as they call it, in the context of a series of earlier North-South Korean agreements. Uh, and again, to looking at the 1992 Joint Declaration, when they said nuclear-free, they meant uh, with respect to the two Koreas. So you, you don't view this as involving any kind of commitment from the U.S.? I don't think it binds the United States, no. After the summit on Friday, President Trump tweeted this, Korean War to End. The United States and all of its great people should be very proud of what is now taking place in Korea. I don't have to remind you, Mr. Ambassador, that up to this point, Kim has said some stuff, but he has given up precisely nothing. Any concern that President Trump is getting carried away? Uh, not at all. As I said, there's nobody starry-eyed around here, and we've all been called a number of things. Naive is not usually one of them. I think the president sees the potential here for a historic agreement, uh, a breakthrough that nobody could have imagined uh, even a few months ago. That potential is there. Uh, but as he says repeatedly, uh, the potential for no deal at all is also there. And, and we're not going to know uh, until we actually have the meeting and see what Kim Jong-un is prepared to do. It's certainly the case that mere words aren't going to sway anybody. Now, it's certainly the case that you have never had any illusions about the Kim regime. I suspect you expected me to do what I'm about to do. Here are some of your greatest hits. I think the only diplomatic option left is to end the regime in North Korea by effectively having the South take it over. Here's an all-purpose uh, insult that you can use. I'll apply it to the, to the North Koreans. Question, how do you know when the North Korean regime is lying? Answer, when their lips are moving. Now, I got to tell folks that while we were playing those, <laughs> Ambassador Bolton had a smile on your face. Who should we believe, that John Bolton or this one? Well, you know, uh, I'll give you the same answer I gave to Martha McCallum the day the president tweeted my nomination when I didn't even know I had been relieved of my duties at Fox News. 
you know, I've said and written a lot of things over the years. I stand by every one of them. Uh, but I was a freelancer back then. I had the luxury of voicing my own opinion. That's not my job now. I'm simply an advisor. The decision maker here uh, is the president. And I don't think really there's anything to be served by uh, going back to those golden oldies and comparing them to what the president's position is now. My advice to him, you know, I give in private. He makes the decisions. That's how it works. Now, Kim told the South Koreans Friday that South Koreans are now saying is that he would give all of his weapons up if the U.S. promises not to invade. Is that the kind of a guarantee that we would be willing to make? Look, th this is part of a discussion that, that remains to be had. We've heard similar things from North Korea before. That's why I think uh, that while we should be optimistic in pursuing the opportunity, we should be skeptical of rhetoric until we see some concrete evidence. Well, I'm not going to pull one of your old bites now. I'm going to pull one of President Trump's from this week. Take a look. Kim Jong-un was, uh, he really has been uh, very open and I think very honorable from everything we're seeing. Kim Jong-un, open and honorable? I think the president is focused on doing everything he can to make this meeting a success. Uh, it's somewhat different than what he said before, but I think he's saying, look, if you're going to come with a real uh, strategic determination to give up nuclear weapons, we're going to have a very serious conversation. Okay, let's turn to Iran, where President Trump has a May 12th deadline to decide whether or not to reimpose sanctions on the regime in Tehran and to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. The administration is talking with our European allies about a plan to stay in the deal, but to add agreements that would limit Iran's ballistic missiles, sanction regional aggression, and end the sunset clause when Iran can start to break out and, and, and restart its nuclear program in 2025. Would President Trump accept that, stay in the deal if you had those kind of, of strengthening add-ons? Well, let, let me start by underlying he has made no decision on the nuclear deal, whether to stay in or get out. He is certainly considering uh, the framework, the four pillars that President Macron laid out in their meetings last week, uh, the Iran nuclear situation now, the Iran nuclear situation in the future, Iran's ballistic missiles, uh, and regional peace and security. Uh, and that, I think, is something that's uh, of interest to the president and worth pursuing. But in terms specifically of the nuclear deal, there's no decision on that yet. But, but I guess what I'm asking is, does he feel that the, that the deal itself is fatally flawed or does he think that if you address some of his other concerns like ballistic missiles like the sunset clause like their, their regional uh, actions as a bad actor around the world that he you could fix the deal well the, the question is fixable is really the question he certainly said very negative things about the deal which uh, which imply that uh, that these other steps wouldn't really address that concern but look it's possible in the discussions with our european allies that we'll be able to see some possibility there he'll make the decision when it's appropriate to make the decision and that'll be uh, up until may 12. finally and we have been colleagues and always gotten along but you know i don't have to tell you you're a controversial figure here in washington and i want to talk briefly about that. Former Secretary of State Powell's chief of staff said of you publicly, he's an absolutely brutal manager, treats people like dirt. Since you came in three weeks ago, at least four top officials in the National Security Council have either been pushed out or left. How do you plead to the charge doesn't play well with others? And in your new role, as you say, you're not a free actor now, you're a member of staff. Are you changing your ways, either softening your views or softening the way you conduct business? Well, it's also possible that the news media have that wrong and that people who have disagreed with me in the past have a certain view of my conduct that I don't agree with. Uh, I'll let others speak to it. I have uh, my views. I express my views. I try and manage fairly. I have made some changes uh, in the staff uh, of the National Security Council. Uh, I think that's perfectly appropriate. Change and continuity are uh, two key elements in, uh, in, in any organization, and uh, we'll try going forward to get the right people there. But I think much of this uh, mischaracterization uh, was addressed back in my confirmation process for UN Ambassador in 2005. I invite all of those interested to read the report of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Do you think you get a bad rap? 
Uh, I think that's almost inherent in Washington today. We've seen even last night at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, which I was happy not to attend, uh, just reprehensible behavior by somebody uh, addressing the gathering. And uh, sadly, it's par for the course in Washington today. I have to say, I'm glad I didn't attend either. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Bolton, thank you. Thanks for sharing your time with us. Please come back, sir. Will do. Up next, Democratic Senator Chris Coons on the... As President Trump prepares for a summit with Kim Jong-un and negotiates with European leaders about the future of the Iran nuclear deal, we want to get a different perspective. Joining us now, Democratic Senator Chris Coons, one of the leading voices on the Foreign Relations Committee. And Senator, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Thanks, Chris. Great to be with you. You have been very critical of President Trump for some of his threatening of North Korea over the last year. So here you were last summer when the president talked about raining fire and fury on the Kim regime. I don't frankly think blustery rhetoric is what's called for at this time. We shouldn't, as a superpower, make threats we are not fully prepared to follow through on immediately. Looking back now, was President Trump right and were you wrong and did his unconventional style of threats uh, and insults and especially the maximum pressure of his economic sanctions, did that get us to the place we are right now where Kim is at the table? Well, we've been here three times before, as you know, under previous administrations of both parties. Uh, Kim Jong-un, his father, his grandfather, the regime that uh, rules North Korea, has done a two-steps-forward, one-step-back strategy where they make progress in their nuclear weapons program or missile program and then agree to come to the table and negotiate denuclearization, which doesn't come through. I'll give President Trump credit for having helped create this opening through the sanctions regime he's helped put together and put in place. Uh, and I was encouraged by what I heard from Ambassador Bolton, a determination to not lighten up on North Korea until there are verifiable and irreversible changes to their nuclear weapons program. Um, there's going to be a lot of hard work ahead. A summit isn't a strategy, but having an upcoming summit with an opening where the um, supreme leader of North Korea has already made a number of encouraging offers, I think is a terrific opportunity. So I want to pick up on the quite hard line that Ambassador Bolton just took, which in effect was, you got to give up everything before we give up anything. Do you think that's practical and do you think that's the way to go? Uh, my hunch is we're going to have to take several confidence building steps on both sides. But for us to back off the sanctions against North Korea without a process in place for a verifiable and irreversible change to the nuclear weapons program would be a mistake. And what about when Kim talks about a denuclearization of the entire peninsula and the possibility that that means that we would keep nukes in the form of either planes or ships off the peninsula? Is that something you could live with? That's not something that I would embrace, um, but I think there's a lot of players here that need to be included and consulted. The South Korean government, uh, the Japanese government, uh, these are countries that are vital allies of ours in the region that have been directly threatened by Kim Jong-un as well as the United States. But to be clear, one of the things Kim Jong-un has been saying recently is, I've developed this nuclear weapons capability to defend my country, my regime from an aggressive United States. I do think we can and should repeat our commitment to not seek regime change as long as they are also making positive steps towards uh, signing an end to the Korean conflict, uh, restoring relations with South Korea, and making progress in negotiations with the United States. I want to turn to Iran because you've also criticized President Trump for threatening to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. But because of this threat, President Macron this week, Chancellor Merkel came to Washington to plead with him to make what I was just discussing with John Bolton, these kinds of side deals on issues mm -hmm. the nuclear deal doesn't cover again is Mr. Trump's hard line in the case of Iran, is that also working? Well, I think this is a terrific opportunity uh, for President Trump, who made his reputation as a builder, uh, to build on the Iran nuclear deal and to deal with, as you just said, the areas that were not uh, fully resolved through the Iran nuclear deal, the ballistic missile program, their support for terrorism in the region, their terrible human rights record. The Iranian regime is a dangerous, threatening regime. And if President Trump can successfully lead an effort with our European allies uh, to rein in or to end their ballistic missile program, uh, to put uh, a, to change the outcome of the current uh, Iranian deal so that there isn't a sunset clause, I think these would po be positive things that I would support. The president 
fired back Friday at Iran's threat to pull out of uh, the nuclear deal if these added sanctions, if these added threats are put on the deal. Here was President Trump's response. They restart their nuclear program. They will have bigger problems than they have ever had before. They will not be doing nuclear weapons, that I can tell you. Okay? They're not going to be doing nuclear weapons. You can bank on it. Given how successful President Trump seems to have been with his threats, at least so far. So far. <laughs> so far. So far. Uh, do you have any problems with that? Um, I think making it clear to Iran um, that it continues to be our position that we will not allow them to develop nuclear weapons uh, is completely appropriate. Um, Iran has threatened um, both our vital ally Israel um, and our European allies and the United States, as has Kim Jong-un of North Korea, and drawing a clear line that we will not tolerate uh, a nuclear-capable um, Iran, I think, is completely appropriate. But it's my hope that the president will pursue the wiser path of, contain, of continuing to get the advantages we are currently getting out of the Iran nuclear deal. Don't take my word for it. His own secretary of defense, Jim Mattis, has said the same. The Republican chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee has said the same. Even folks who oppose the Iran nuclear deal today see that we get more benefits by staying in it than by tearing it up. I, I'm just curious because this must be an interesting time for you and a lot of other Democrats who've been very critical of this president when it comes to foreign policy. And at least for now, and it's a preliminary stage, nothing's been decided with Kim, nothing has happened specifically with Iran, but it does seem to be working. If it works, um, I'll be the first to cheer on the president because, frankly, uh, although we are political opponents, we have different values and we come at politics and public service in different ways, um, I want the United States to succeed. So if President Trump's strategy succeeds with North Korea, succeeds with Iran, um, that's in our country's best interest. Let's turn to the special counsel's Russia investigation. You were one of four senators, two Democrats, two Republicans, who sponsored a bill the Senate Judiciary Committee passed this week by a wide margin to protect the special counsel if President Trump were to move to fire him. Why do you think that's necessary? Uh, well, I think it's necessary because President Trump himself keeps tweeting or saying things that suggest he hasn't um, fully given up the idea of possibly firing Robert Mueller. He called into Fox and Friends just last Thursday. He's issued a whole series of tweets saying that this is a witch hunt, that it's an attack on him and on democracy. It shouldn't be allowed to go on. And so as long as he is making these threatening statements, uh, and as long as it's not clear why the Republican leadership in both the House and Senate, who say Robert Mueller should be left alone, should be unmolested, should be able to complete his investigation, um, they say they have confidence that President Trump won't fire Robert Mueller. I have no confidence, and obviously my colleagues, both Republican and Democrat, on the Judiciary Committee looked at this bill, which is an ounce of prevention, as my mom used to say, well worth a pound of cure. Um, they looked at it and said, this is a, a modest but reasonable step to make it just a little bit harder for the president uh, to abruptly and without cause fire Robert Mueller. This would be in the best interests of the country and of the president, frankly. I, I just want to pick up on that because Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, as you point out, has said flatly he is not going to let the full Senate vote on this bill, which was approved by the Senate Judiciary Committee this week. Let's take a look at the senator. I'm the one who decides what we, what we take to the floor. That's right. my responsibility as the majority leader, and we'll not be having this on the floor of the Senate. One, why do you think McConnell is refusing to bring up the bill? And two, is there anything you can do about it? Well, folks said this bill would never get a hearing. It got a hearing. They said it'd never get a markup. It got a markup. They said it'd never get through Judiciary Committee. It got through by a bipartisan 14 to 7 vote. As long as President Trump continues to say and do things uh, that I'm sure his attorneys would prefer he didn't, uh, to threaten to take action against the Department of Justice or Robert Mueller, I think the pressure to bring this to the floor will build. If it were put on the floor this coming week, I think we'd get 60 votes for it. Um, so frankly, it's my hope that the majority leader will change his mind. And why do you think he is, his mind at this point is no bill, no vote? Well, I think as the majority leader, he continues to say it would be disastrous for the president to interfere with the investigation, but I have confidence he won't. I don't know what that confidence is based on. This bill would be a responsible small measure uh, to preempt some constitutional crisis. Frankly, I'll say to the president, if you're watching, Mr. President, saying that you would sign this bill is the single boldest thing you could do to shut up the critics who say there is a risk you might fire Robert Mueller. Senator Coons, thank you.
Thanks for coming in today. Always good to talk with you, sir. Thank you. Up next, we'll bring in our Sunday group. Consider what I did with Mr. Richmond Leak. I told him about an unclassified conversation with the president. Do you remember John Lovitz? Do you remember? The liar. Well, Comey's worse. Comey's a liar and a leaker. Former FBI Director James Comey and President Trump at a campaign style rally last night, continuing their war of words over who's telling the American people the truth. And it's time now for our Sunday group, former Trump campaign senior advisor Jason Miller, Mo Alethi of Georgetown University's Institute of Politics and Public Service, Fox News analyst Marie Harf and Rich Lowry of the National Review. Rich, as the Comey book tour rules on, who do you think is winning uh, the battle for public opinion, the former FBI director or President Trump? Well, I think Comey's obviously winning the battle for book sales, but I view this a little bit like the Michael Wolff phenomenon, where he sold books hand over fist, but in the course of his book tour, his reputation took a dent. And I think that's true of Comey. It's clear he's a wily and manipulative operative and careerist. Not the worst thing to be in Washington, and there are a lot of them, but it makes the sanctimony really hard to take. And this kind of private definition he has of what constitutes leaking that clearly is tailored to exculpate him from his own leaking is also really hard to take. Mo, uh, let me pick up your, your sense of how uh, James Comey is doing. There were, there were two things he said in the interview with Brett Baer this week. One, it, it, frankly, almost Clintonian, what's a leak? Uh, and the other is that uh, he claims he didn't know the Democrats had paid for the, uh, for the dossier, even when he was in, into 2017. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with Rich on this. I, I think if you agree it, about. Well, I agree that his that it's raising a lot of questions about him, the, the more this book tour goes on. But at the end of the day, to your question about public opinion, at the, if you love Donald Trump, you're, he's going to be winning the, the war of public opinion here. If you hate Donald Trump, Comey is probably winning uh, the war. So no minds are changing here. So I don't think anyone's mind is getting changed. And more importantly, Bob Mueller's investigation goes on right. undeterred. Well, I want to pick up on that with you because the president once again made it clear this week that his patience with the Mueller investigation is running out. Take a look. I'm very disappointed in my Justice Department, but because of the fact that it's going on, and I think you'll understand this, I have decided that I won't be involved. I may change my mind at some point, mm -hmm. because what's going on is a disgrace. It's an absolute right. disgrace. At this point, do you think the president may still pull the plug on the Mueller investigation, or do you think the real likelihood of that is receding? Uh, I don't know. All right, and that's the problem here is that we don't know. Uh, he, he, he's given no real indication that everyone should just feel confident that it's going to continue. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I would hope that he takes the advice of the Democrats and the Republicans on the Hill that he should keep his hands off and just let this thing play out. And if he, if he has nothing to worry about, he should want it to play out. Jason, it certainly isn't helpful for the president to say, well, I may change my mind. Well, I think this investigation is imploding uh, under the uh, weight of there being absolutely nothing there. I mean, the fact that we're over wait, a wait, year wait. and a half. We don't know that. Uh, well, uh, there, nothing has been proven. We're over a year and a half into this thing. We don't, There's absolutely we don't nothing, know. We, but nothing in Washington, Jason, Chris, in Washington. We don't. We're I'm talking about out. the Mueller investigation. Right. We have no idea what he's finding. But there is. If there I'm not saying been, that he's finding if, anything, but we don't know that. If it's, there would have been something on collusion, that would have leaked out. That would have gotten out so long long ago there is nothing so to wait, wait. so you're now process. saying because there isn't a leak I mean, I thought you condemned Blake. No, a leak Which is, is terrible. Leaks good or bad? No, leaks are terrible. But you know that the, if there was a way to hurt President Trump, that it would have leaked out, and that would have been out there. There's been no evidence after a year and a half plus of searching of any collusion. There's been nothing that's been proven to that point. Comey has gone from the quintessential G-man to basically just another political hack. I mean, this is very clearly a politically driven operation. I'm talking about We've Mueller seen, now, not Comey. Right. And so far, there's been nothing untoward about the president or his activity or anything that has been put forward. So I think that most of the people around the country are taking a look at this and saying, you know what, the president's probably right. This is a witch hunt and needs to get wrapped up. So if there's nothing that's been found, why not let 
Mueller finishes investigation. Well, I think ultimately that's what will happen. I think that the legal team that the president has now assembled with Rudy Giuliani and also with Marty and Jane Raskin, I think is a very good team. And I think the advice that they're going to give him is smart. And I think that he should listen to them. Uh, and I think hopefully this will be wrapped up soon. All right. I want to continue with you because we had a troubling case this week of Admiral Ronnie Jackson, the president's personal doctor, who dropped out as the nominee to lead the, Bar the Department of Veterans Affairs after a volley of allegations from Democratic Senator John Tester. Take a look. Getting to the bottom of these accusations is critically important, and there should be no there should be no stone unturned. Tester started throwing out things that he's heard. Well, I know things about Tester that I could say, too. And if I said him, he'd never be elected again. Jason, not only were none of the allegations verified, but perhaps the most explosive one that Tester raised, that, that uh, Jackson had gotten drunk at a Secret Service going away party and had crashed his car, was specifically denied. Will Republicans now go after Tester, who's up for re-election this year? Absolutely. And I think a lot of Republican strategists that you talked to a week or so ago probably would have said that Tester is one of the strongest uh, of the so-called vulnerable Democrats that are up. But I think there's going to be a newfound focus put on him. But what Senator Tester did with making those personal attacks against Ronnie Jackson, who by all accounts is a very honorable person, I think really was uh, very despicable. I think that Senator Tester will be in the crosshairs now uh, for this election. And really, this is what happens in the swamp. Uh, if they can't be on the merits, they go to the personal attacks. Marie, what, what struck me about this case is that there was plenty of, of smoke mm -hmm. about uh, uh, Admiral Jackson, a lot of it supplied by John Tester, but no fire at all. There, were, there was not a single verified allegation, and yet he still was forced out. Here's the challenge. Over 20 current and former service members came to John Tester as a senator and said, these are our concerns. You're right, John Tester had not verified them, but these weren't his allegations. These were people who served with Ronnie Jackson. He, Senator Tester, worked with the Republican committee chair to postpone the hearing because the Republicans were so concerned about the severity of these. And I take it back to the way Ronnie Jackson was announced. If the White House had gone through a vetting process like most White Houses do, some of these, if not all, would have surfaced. They would have been able to run them down if, in fact, they're not true. And they would have been able to head off these allegations instead of pulling the nomination back at a time when they really need a head of the VA. So Chester was put in a tough position. These weren't his allegations. People came to him with them. And as a senator, it's his duty to bring them forward. He has voted for every one of Trump's VA nominees. The president has signed eight bills that John Tester has put forward on the VA. This is a guy who's fought for you veterans. Don't, you don't bring them forward without doing any real due diligence on them. Sure, check so them out. So what should he have done? He shouldn't have aired unverified allegations. He should have done some investigation. He should have checked in with the Secret Service that's now batted down some of these more lurid allegations. And look, I, I think uh, Jackson should have been duty bound to defend himself. Um, if these allegations were untrue, and a number of them seem to be, but I think the problem with the nomination, it was on such tenuous ground to right. begin with, just the slightest little uh, additional weight right. on the scale made it indefensible. All right, panel, I'm glad we settled that. We have to take a break here. Up next, more on the president's moves this week on North Korea and Iran. Plus, what would you like to ask the panel about the risks and rewards of a Trump-Kim summit? Just go to Facebook or Twitter at Fox News Sunday. And we may use your question on the air. We will make sure that the agreement we have reached, which the people of the Korean Peninsula and the world are watching, does not fulfill the unfortunate history of unfulfilled promises. One of the fake news groups this morning, they were saying, what do you think uh, President Trump had to do with it? I'll tell you what, like how about everything? I think he was probably funnier than the comedian at the White House Correspondents <laughs> Dinner. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un pledging this time agreements he makes with South Korean leaders won't fall apart, and President Trump taking credit for bringing Kim to the table. And we're back now with the panel. Well, we ask you for questions for the panel, and ever since we got this one, I have been 
excited about asking Marie Harf, spokeswoman for the John Kerry State Department, the question we got on Facebook from Mark Bellman, who asks, will Trump win the Nobel Peace Prize if he successfully negotiates the denuclearization of North Korea? If not, why not? I should point out at that rally last night, people were chanting Nobel, Nobel. Marie, how do you answer Mark? I have no idea. Um, but this isn't about Donald Trump at the end of the day. The U.S. plays a key role. Um, but this is really about North and South Korea. And you've seen with a new South Korean president, the South Koreans really step up and take the initiative. You know, this isn't about taking victory laps. And I know that at a campaign rally, it can seem um, like the thing to chant, although I've never heard that at a campaign rally before in my or campaign style rally in my life. Um, but we'll see what happens here. This is not all about the U.S., and we need to remain tempered in our expectations about what will come. I, out I understand that. all of that, but you're you're really not going to give Donald Trump credit for the fact that Kim, under pressure, under military pressure, under economic pressure, has come to the table. I will, yes, I will absolutely give the administration credit for ramping up the pressure and for getting us to where we are today and for being willing to sit down and talk and invest in diplomacy. Absolutely. But we also have to remember the North Koreans have before agreed to denuclearize. They have agreed to end the Korean War. And every time those things have been agreed to, they have fallen apart. So we have to be very prudent as we go into these talks about not giving up too much not letting the pressure up because we've heard this game before and it's never ended the way we wanted. Jason, I understand that there are some wanted, warranted I told you so's from Trump supporters <laughs> like your, yourself as Kim comes to the, the negotiating table. But is there a danger? And I, I pointed out to uh, Ambassador Bolton, the Korean War is ended. Is there a danger of Trump getting swept up in summit hype? Well, I think the comments that you've seen from the president have been pretty clear-eyed about this, uh, about recognizing uh, that we still have a long ways to go. But to answer the question that Marie uh, danced around a little bit, I would go and give President Trump the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm sure that uh, comes as a, a total shock to everybody here. I was going to say, I don't think you're on the Nobel Peace Prize committee. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's someone's got to start the ball rolling. And so I'll go and, uh, and you're going to take get, that this morning. Yeah, and I'll, I'll help the president out here this morning. But I think uh, based on what we've already seen so far with the steps that um, – they've taken towards ending the war. I mean, even moving into the same time zone. These might seem like small things to us, but these are pretty big. And also, as we saw this morning from Ambassador Bolton with his comments, that the U.S. isn't going to just uh, you know, listen to the lip service that we are going to make sure that concrete steps are taken. So I think the administration has taken a very strong approach on this. But let's be clear about the, the bigger picture thing that's going on here is what President Trump has done is he's proven wrong. All of the, the foreign policy so-called experts uh, who wanted Hillary Clinton to win, uh, who they basically have gotten us into all these foreign policy messes. If we had taken these strong approaches with regards to economic sanctions, with regards to military threats and being tough, and we started doing that back during Clinton, we wouldn't have been in this mess in the first place. All right, let's turn to Iran, because again, you have to say that President Trump seems to be bending the world to his will here. Here is French President Macron this week addressing Congress on the need to toughen the Iran nuclear deal. It is true to say that this agreement may not address all concerns and very important concerns. This is true. Mo, that's what President Trump has been saying all along. And this week, both Macron and Merkel seem to agree with him that, yes, the standing by itself, the Iran deal is not enough and that you need some strengthening provisions. I don't. And Marie can correct me if I'm wrong, I can't remember anyone ever saying that the Iran deal was perfect. I think a lot of people, even in the Obama administration, said, yeah, this thing isn't exactly where it needs to be, but this is an important step forward and that anyone would be open to it being strengthened. What you see now are American allies. Then why didn't the, like the French, why, well, excuse me, why yeah. didn't uh, the U.S., Kerry and Obama strengthen it in the remaining time in office? Well, I think they went about as far as they could go at the time. And, and now you see our allies, like France and Germany, really worried that the United States is going to pull out 
begging for us to try to, you know, stay in it. And if it if we don't, talking about trying to figure out some some new deal without us. And this is what worries me about the Trump administration's foreign policy is that time and time again, whether we're talking about trade or whether we're talking about the Iran deal, we are leaving our allies out there to have to figure out how to move forward in the world without us. And that that worries me. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Trump has moved very usefully beyond the Obama legacy. So the Obama position basically, oh, we can't enforce the red line, it's too complicated, it's too hard. Well, it wasn't. We um, need a policy of strategic patience, which was Obama's policy with North Korea, which basically means waiting around for the North Koreans to develop a nuclear tip ICBM that can threaten the continental United States. And Trump's like, no, I'm not going to accept that. I'm going to try to shake something loose. And now with Iran, this deal was a boon to the Iranians. It gave them enormous economic benefits. They've spread their influence even further in the Middle East to the, the border of Israel, where you have ongoing conflict now, and a lot of the nuclear provisions will expire in 10 years. That's a wonderful deal for the Iranians. It's not a good deal for us, and I think he's right to try to shake something else loose there as well. Uh, Marie, as someone who was involved in the negotiations mm -hmm. under Secretary Kerry uh, with Iran, I mean, the president is pointing out a lot of things that he says were wrong, was wrong with the deal that your secretary negotiated, that we gave him all the benefits up front, that, uh, that we didn't control their bad acting in the world, we didn't control their ballistic missile program, there was this sunset clause. He's basically saying you made a bad deal and he's fixing it. Well, he's not fixing it. He's threatening to blow it up without something to replace it with. And no, look, that's not, well, that's well, not, well, wait a minute, that's he not true. He's, he's at least talking about adding these provisions. We're not sure what he's going to do by May 12. Exactly. He has some principles. But look, on the nuclear side, we did not give them all the benefits up front. With their nuclear program today, under the transparency, monitoring, and verification, with what they have, they cannot make a nuclear weapon. If you're concerned about sunset, if you're concerned about 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, fine. I'll take that as a, as, a, as a criticism, work to make it longer, don't make it shorter by pulling out of it now. So I actually think Macron was very smart this week in saying the nuclear deal was very good in a lot of ways. Let's not just throw that out. Let's work to strengthen the other but pieces the of is, it. The point is he would not be as motivated to try to do that if Trump wasn't pressuring and threatening to pull out of the deal. Sure, but there's a fine line between pressure and being irresponsible. And if we'll see what happens on May 12th. Because if Donald Trump walks away from this deal and we lose all of the transparency and monitoring and verification, if the Iranians go back to enriching uranium, that will be on President Trump. And I think if you're all going right, me, if you're right, pull out of something, you have to but, replace it with something better. But and you, we don't you, have you that. presented one possibility, which is that he pulls out of the deal. What if he agrees with the Europeans and they do add these toughening sanctions, solving what a lot of people think were holes in the original deal that John Kerry negotiated? Great. What then? Great. I would absolutely support it. If we can get the Iranians to agree to longer timelines from the 10, 15, 20, well, wait, wait. 25. No, no, they're not talking about asking the Iranians to agree to it. We're saying, at least that's what, no, that's what the Europeans right. and, and President Trump are saying. This isn't a treaty and that the Europeans and the U.S. can unilaterally say, you do this, we'll impose sanctions. You do this, we'll impose sanctions. So that's not how diplomacy works. When you're negotiating, both sides have to agree to tough decisions. And, and look, the Europeans rightly agree with us that we want to address ballistic missiles. Let's do that in a separate agreement. The, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that addressed the nuclear program has a lot of stuff in it that nonproliferation experts agree is good. It's not perfect, but why would you discard all of that? But, but it, it, go ahead, Rich. It constrains our ability to sanction Iranians for the other behavior. Not and part, of, and part of the strategic true, point of this That's and the salesmanship true. was that it would moderate Iranian behavior. Also if anything, Iranian behavior has become more extreme. <laughs> that's right. not, that's not no, true. That was never no. our argument. Our argument was actually this deal is more necessary if the Iranian regime doesn't Iran change. Iran is funding Hezbollah. Iran is funding Hamas. Yes. This is doing absolutely nothing to stop them from developing their nuclear weapons program. It's slowing them down a little bit. But their, Iran's goal is the full destruction of Israel. That is, that is the, the full goal here. And I think that if we, uh, if the only thing that we're trying to do is slow them down a little bit on their uh, nuclear capabilities, I think we're completely short-sighted here. All we right. have to look at this I, for what's I know going you're on. dying to answer. We will have this conversation during the commercial. Thank you, panel. <laughs> See you next Sunday. Up next, our Power Player of the Week. What's behind the thinking at one of Washington's most powerful think tanks?
Republicans and Democrats clash over ideas. Both, both sides are supported by private organizations that supply data and research. In this intellectual arms race, there is no bigger figure than our power player of the week. Operating in this town, it's more about people and people's lives, and it's not simply about policy and battles and fighting ideological wars. Kay Coles James is talking about the real life consequences of policy struggles in Washington and her role since January as president of the Heritage Foundation, one of DC's top think tanks. The guiding mission of this institution is to be that true north for the conservative movement. Founded in 1973, Heritage has been on the cutting edge of conservative thought and Republican policy. Has Heritage struggled to find a role in Donald Trump's Washington? Absolutely not. There is no struggle. One of the things that I love about being the president of the Heritage Foundation is I don't have to navigate. I just have to stand. Great for the American people. Thank you all. Heritage played a big role in the tax cut bill the president signed last year. But they don't always get their way. President Trump has been embracing tariffs. That's hardly a conservative idea. I would agree. James grew up in public housing in Southern Virginia. Her mom was on welfare. My definition of a conservative is someone who has the audacity to believe what their grandmother taught them. Such as? Not relying on government or anyone else, by the way, to, uh, to clear the path for you. She was in junior high in the early 60s when she was chosen to help integrate her school. We had to walk past dogs and angry parents and shouting people and uh, it, it was a very traumatic period and I've been a fighter all my life. James served in Republican administrations from Reagan to Bush father and son. She was on the Trump transition team but says she was blocked from working for him. I don't like keeping the Amorosa story alive, but I am told that she and, you know, the chief of staff, Priebus at the time, just didn't think it was a good idea. But James has done just fine, running a think tank with almost 300 staffers and a budget of $70 million. Everybody excited about Besides policy, she says her role now is to grow the conservative movement. You don't have to be painted with that angry white male image. But does she think it's just image that has led African Americans to give Republicans between four and eight percent of their votes in the last three presidential elections? The first thing you do with any Republican candidate, any candidate, is find whatever evidence you can, big or small, and paint them as a racist. And James intends to change people's perceptions. It's important to reach out to women. It's important to reach out to minority groups with our message. So I'm not talking conservative light. I'm talking about uh, true north conservative values that all of us can relate to. James says her target audience is, wait for it, Bernie Sanders voters. They want the same things conservatives want, she says, but without the unintended consequences of misguided compassion. And that's it for today. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Fox News Sunday.